Good morning. Today we are going to be talking about mass movements. Basically, that's landslides. And just like with the other hazards, I'm going to start out this lecture with a hazard map. We have the lower 48 states here, and what we see is in uh, red. The red areas have very high potential for landslides. The yellow areas have high potential, and the green areas have moderate potential. Landslides can and do occur in the black areas, but the potential is low. So what we're really seeing is high potential for landslides in the coastal mountains uh, of California, Oregon, Washington, in the Rocky Mountain region, and in the Appalachian Mountains. We don't have a huge potential for landslides right around here. Well, why is that? Well, in order to have a landslide, you need uh, topography. You need some kind of a slope for these landslides to happen. So when we talk about mass movements, uh, depending what textbook you have, they might also call it mass wasting. Those are synonyms. A mass movement is the large scale movement of material down slope under the force of gravity. So obviously we need a slope and um, the ultimate cause of mass movements is going to be the force of gravity. That's what's pulling these things downwards. Now, of course, you can have um, things that make mass movements more likely to happen in some areas than others, but ultimately the energy, the power behind any mass movement is going to be gravity. So let's take a look at how this works. So basically, what we have right here, we have a slope. And the angle of the slope is right here, and that's fish. Actually, that's alpha. So alpha is the angle of our slope, and we have a mass sitting on that slope. Gravity is pulling downwards on that. And because we're at a slope, gravity, the force of it, is actually separated into these two vectors. And uh, one of those is shear stress, which is going to be pulling the mass down this way. And what is fighting that shear stress? Well, that is friction. So as long as friction is greater than shear stress, this mass is going to be just fine. It's just going to sit there. But how do we calculate shear stress? Well, that's equal to the load, that's the mass, times sine of alpha. So the shear stress, things that can cause that to change, would be the load could get heavier, or the angle alpha could change. And that could then make shear stress greater than friction. And when shear stress is greater than friction, sliding occurs. And uh, so that's our basic physics of these, uh, these mass movements. All right, so let's look at some of the things that then can affect the stability of a slope. Well, the slope itself. The steeper the angle, think of that drawing that I had there, right? The steeper the angle, the less stable your slope is going to be. And when we're looking at unconsolidated materials, Unconsolidated simply means uh, materials that are not glued together, not stuck together. So think of like the sand on the beach or a pile of gravel or something like that that you could dig into with a shovel or your hands. That's unconsolidated. And the angle of repose is the steepest angle at which dry, unconsolidated material is stable. So if we dump a bunch of this unconsolidated material down, it automatically goes to its angle of repose. If we were to dig into the side of this thing, well, this would slide down and restore that angle of repose. Um, and what I was just talking about was undercutting, right, where we dig into something. Well, you can get undercutting in unconsolidated materials, and then they'll simply slide and, right, they'll slide back in and restore that angle of repose. But you can also get undercutting in solid rocks. That's relatively common at coastlines, 
where you have wave action that basically erodes away the rocks down here. And now notice there's nothing supporting the rocks right there. That's undercut, which means now gravity can easily start pulling these rocks downwards. Okay. You can actually even see some fallen rocks right down there. All right, other things that can affect the stability of a slope. Well, the material or the uh, rock characteristics, things like fractures. If rocks already have a lot of cracks in them, then it's going to be easier for these small pieces to fall off. Also, the orientation of rocks. Movement tends to occur when layers are parallel to slope. So if your slope is going down like this and all your layers are also oriented in that direction, things will tend to slide that way more. Water greatly influences slope stability. Water does a whole bunch of different things. First of all, water adds weight. Every gallon of water is something like a bit over eight pounds. Now imagine you have a big rainstorm, you're going to have more than one gallon of water fall, right? You're going to have a lot of it. So we are adding a lot of weight. Remember that diagram that I showed you? Mass, right? The load was part of slope stability. If we increase the mass, we might be decreasing the stability. Water also can saturate a material, which reduces cohesion. So if you've ever built a sandcastle, and I hope all of you guys have, but you know when you build a sandcastle, you want the sand to be somewhat wet, because a little bit of water in the sand increases cohesion. It makes the sand stick together more. But if you put too much sand in your bucket of water, well, then the sand just kind of flows everywhere, right? And that's because too much water reduces the cohesion that you have. So if you have too much water, saturation means your sediment is completely filled with water, this will reduce the cohesion. Water also reduces friction. And so we can imagine right here, first of all, we have these layers of rock that are parallel to the slope, so they're more likely to slide down that way. But then if we get some water in between these layers, well, we know that uh, there's always those floor signs that say slippery when wet. And it's because water reduces friction so things don't stick together as well. So if we get some water in between those layers, these could easily slide downwards. So water also reduces friction. Water does other things to affect slope stability. You can get something called frost wedging happening. And this happens when water freezes in, uh, in openings and in, like little cracks in rocks. When water freezes, it expands. So if you have a small crack and water freezes in there, it can make it bigger, which can actually eventually break apart rocks and ultimately uh, let gravity take over and cause them to fall off the cliff or something. You can also have something called frost heaving, which can uh, play a role in something called soil creep, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, other things that can affect slope stability. Vegetation, the plants growing in a place. The roots of plants can stabilize a slope. They can actually grow into the material and hold it in place. Or they can cause root wedging, where they'll actually grow into a material and start breaking it apart. So vegetation, it really depends on what type of material is the vegetation growing in and what kind of vegetation is it, whether it helps stabilize a slope or helps destabilize a slope. And what we're looking at right here is some root wedging. We had these, this rock right here was originally stuck together. Uh, a tree, a, a little seed fell in there, and as the tree grew up, it ended up splitting that rock in two. Just like what we see right here. There's a root right in there of a pine tree that split that rock in two. 
All right, vegetation also absorbs moisture from soil. So, you know, we talked about how water can reduce friction and cohesion, while the vegetation can actually take some of that water out and thus help stabilize a slope. But vegetation adds weight. So, like I said, vegetation is one of those things. Maybe it helps stabilize the slope, maybe it doesn't. All right, earthquakes will also affect slope stability. When you get all that shaking going on, you can get new fractures, new cracks developing in the rocks. And as the actual shaking is going on, it can reduce friction. So imagine what some of the waves push the rocks up and then drop down. As they're dropping down, that reduces friction and can allow things to begin sliding or moving. Other things that affect slope stability are the, the, the material that makes up the slope itself. Things like quick clays. Quick clays or sensitive clays have a unique structure. They have this like house of cards structure. So if we were to look at these clay minerals, they look like a playing card. They're really thin in one direction and kind of longer in other directions. And they're all sitting on edge with each other. And um, uh, they tend to be glued together with like uh, some salts. But you know, if you ever build a house of cards, it's very unstable. You can have just a small uh, thing happen and the whole thing collapses. And that's exactly what can happen with this. You can have the initial structure look like that, but then you have something that ends up um, um, uh, jostling the quick clay area or maybe you get some rain or something like that and the whole structure collapses and the clays kind of compact together and uh, that's what we actually see right here in uh, in Norway this area here was underlain by quick clays that collapsed and we can see um, this next photo is taken from this road right over here, looking towards that area. And you can see these, there were buildings built on there because it looked like it was just fine to build there, but then it collapsed. Uh, the good news about quick clays is that they are not the most uh, common thing. Uh, we don't have them around here. They tend to form in more Arctic areas, places where you had glaciers in the past. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the types of mass movements that we uh, can have on Earth. And uh, we can have a mass movement that has a free-falling motion, and this will be called a fall. And when you have this free-falling motion, it means the material is not always touching the ground underneath it. So stuff is actually kind of flying through the air or bouncing or something like that. And this is usually going to be rock because to get this free-falling motion, you need a steep slope and unconsolidated materials tend not to form steep slopes as much. And uh, these Falls of rock are common at steep or undercut slopes. So, for instance, we have this nice steep slope here. We have this potential rock fall up there. There's a time when it has this free-falling motion, and then it lands at the bottom. Now, what can happen over time is we still have this big steep slope right there, right? So more rocks are going to fall, and eventually you'll get a pile of what we call talus. And talus is just all these jumbled up bits and pieces of rock that have fallen from that steep slope. So if you see this talus, it's a good indication that you have frequent rock falls at that location. And we can actually see that right here. This is uh, at Lake Mead, the border between Arizona and Nevada. And we have this black rock up here, and that's sitting on top of this kind of tan-colored rock. But notice right here, we have all of this black rock that fell from up here and has kind of covered that area up. That's our talus, all this rock that has fallen from there. And if you get close to one of these talus slopes, uh, this is what it looks like. All of this rock fell off a cliff that's basically right up here. 
and we can see there's big rocks, there's smaller rocks, and basically they've all fallen and kind of bounced to that location. All right, uh, here we are in Texas, and uh, you can see there are rock falls here, and where are they coming from? Up here. So that's probably not a good housing choice, right? Because eventually this is going to fall down as well. Now, it's not a good idea to build your house at the edge of a steep slope. It is, oh, check that out. Don't climb those stairs if you're drunk because they actually hang over the edge of the cliff. Uh, so not a real good idea because that will eventually fall. But not a good idea to build at the top of one of these cliffs. Also not a good idea to build right at the bottom of one of those cliffs because those rocks are going to go somewhere like maybe your blue recliner. All right, so that's a fall where we have this free falling motion or something bouncing, the materials not always touching the ground underneath. Well, another type of mass movement is a slide. And in a slide, you have cohesive material that moves on a well-defined surface. Now, cohesive means it stays stuck together. So you have this, this chunk of material that slides over a well-defined surface, and it's still all nicely stuck together when it comes to a stop. And usually when you have one of these slides, you're going to have this thing called the scarp or the head scarp that shows where it came from. And notice how this pretty much stayed stuck together where it looks like if you're all powerful, you could kind of push it back into place and it would all just line up back where it belonged. It hasn't really broken apart that much. And I like to use this illustration to show you what I mean by staying cohesive. This material started out over here and it slid across the road. It's definitely stayed cohesive because we still even have the trees growing in there, right? So it, it did not get all broken apart in pieces. It just stayed stuck together and moved over that surface. Now we do have two basic types of slides that can occur. You can have what's called a translational slide. This is usually rock and it moves on a planar surface. Or you can also have a rotational slide. These are sometimes called slumps. And uh, these are usually unconsolidated material. So we're talking about sediment or soil and the movement is going to be on a curved surface. Now this is what we mean by planar surface. My material started there, slid down here. That's the curved surface that we're talking about in the rotational slide, right? The material started there and slid downwards that way. So if this area here would happen to have one of these slides, we have rock, and the surface is planar, well, that would be a translational slide. This is where we had a rotational slide happen about seven years before this photo was taken. There's the scarp where all this material belonged, and it basically kind of rotated downwards to that position. All right. But we do still have other types of mass movements. You can have what's called a flow. And in the case of a flow, the material has a fluid, chaotic movement. It's no longer going to stay stuck together in this one cohesive mass. It's going to move all turbulent and chaotically. And we can have um, uh, these flows typically occur in stream channels, which is what we consider this channelized flow, but you can also sometimes have these occur over hill slopes. But if you notice, they don't keep a specific shape. They flow as a fluid. And there's a number of different types of flows that can occur. Uh, you could have what's called a mud flow. In this case, the material is saturated. That means all of the pore space, the open space in the material, is 100% filled with water. And this is going to be fine-grained material, so we don't have any big boulders in there. And these tend to move really fast, meters per second. You can think of that as miles per hour. 
Now, very similar to a mud flow is what's called a debris flow. With a debris flow, the material is also saturated, but instead of all being small material, we have all kinds of sizes and shapes. So you can have really tiny particles, but you can have big boulders in there as well. And this also travels quite fast. Now, similar to a debris flow is what's known as an earth flow. Now, it is similar because it's, again, all different sizes of material, but in this case, it is not saturated. It might have a lot of water in it, but it's not 100% filled with water. And so it moves slower. This moves meters per day to meters per year. And um, oftentimes what happens is you'll have a debris flow occur. Debris flows frequently occur after you have heavy rain in places. So this material gets saturated and it races down uh, an area, usually, like I said, a stream channel, like a big, muddy, debris-filled flood. And then eventually it stops. But oftentimes it's not really stable yet. And for years after that, after heavy rains, parts of the debris flow might shift and move a bit as an earth flow, this slower moving uh, um, uh, occurrence, not as fast as that initial debris flow. So oftentimes you'll have heavy rains, major debris flow, it stops, but then for decades or even sometimes hundreds of years afterwards, this mass will continue to shift after heavy rains as an earth flow.